Don said it the other day. People that work on this show, they go on to bigger and better things. It's true. They just do. We sell books. We make stars. That's what we do here, right, Don? Really speaks to how talentless I am that I'm still here. Yeah, you, you've had a long run. I'm sorry. It is, it is disappointing when you think about it in that yeah. sense. Yeah. And here's a guy that could tell you how you're failing. Yes. That's Ryan Rucco. He called the games yesterday on ESPN. Oh, more than that, the whole tournament. You kidding me? That's right. And here he is joining us now. He used to be on the show way back when. Hi, way Ryan. When. Hey, guys. How are you? Would you say that Peter's an abject failure because he's been here like six, seven years? You Give it to me, Raw. Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> Peter, Peter has more jobs than all of us combined, which is saying a lot considering how much, a lot of jobs how much here. work we all have. Yeah, I mean, Peter, Peter is, he, and Peter's also, think about it. Peter's not only in the pro sports world, he's also in the wrestling world. Yeah. He's in the music world. Nobody mm. hits more genres and, than Peter. Yeah, wait, well, no, why, no. Can't, why can't we spin it a positive? Most of it, and Ryan, Ryan could be included, definitely Michelle Beadle, they could have done all the things that they went on to do and still did this show. You, mm. you, you're actually saying, I can handle it. I can do all the big time mm, stuff I'm, I'm more and brave. still stay on the show. So You're not, braver than these That's not that I'm a talentless hack. It's that I'm brave. <laughs> yes. Well, Ryan, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate your uh, sweet words. Ryan will always just respect me for what I do because I've interviewed his, his hero, Eminem. Um, that's right. Uh, Ryan, I did think about you, though, and I turned on the game on Saturday. I was at my parents' house in yeah. Maryland, and I turned on the game and, of course, heard your voice. And you, you guys all did a great job. We had Andrea Carter on yesterday. She's been great as well. At Shanae, everyone's been yeah, wonderful in the coverage. But I thought, what a cool moment this is for Ryan. Let's not talk about the growth of the game right now. Let's just be completely selfish. When did it cross your mind that, like, this is actually a pretty cool career thing for you, that you're in this position as the game is having this explosion? You know, you, you just mean, you mean like more generally in recent years when it hit me? No, I mean this, like over the last year. I mean, kind of the yeah. Caitlin Clark of it all. Yeah, I think, you know what's interesting? When I was first starting doing WNBA games, I, I, I you know, I was, I, I was doing the championship, right? I was doing the finals. And it was 2013 was my first year doing it. And... I, at that time, as I've talked about in the past, I didn't fully appreciate how awesome the WNBA was. I quickly learned. But when I got the gig, and I, and I didn't yet fully know that, Woody Fryman, who, as Michael well knows, and you guys know Woody, you know, Woody was an incredible executive with us at Yes for so many years, he said to me, hey, don't underestimate getting to call a championship. And that was one of the first things anybody told me when I was starting at the WNBA. And I quickly realized what he meant. And it's been unbelievable to get to call those moments and then see the growth of the sport. And so I've had this appreciation for getting to help tell the stories of these women at this moment in time as the sport has steadily been increasing its viewership and attention and coverage. And then this moment, Peter, to your point more acutely now, yeah, I absolutely, when I looked at the bracket, I was like, oh my gosh, if we get Iowa LSU, I'm going to get to call that game. That's going to be, you know, a, a, a cultural event in our country. Um, and as we saw last night, and as I could tell just leading up to the game from all the text messages I was getting, uh, it was and then delivered. So, yeah, man, I mean, like, you know, Don, you do play-by-play. -play. Michael, you do play-by-play, -play, obviously. We all know those games, there's just, there's this addictive energy when you call a huge game. And to get to do it in this moment when the sport is booming, like, yeah, I, I have been over the moon with the opportunity to get to do we it. We spoke about this yesterday, so we can ask you directly. So it was about uh, this time we were yeah. talking about the games coming up. And then I just mentioned, I said, well, there might be, we haven't seen the ratings yet. Maybe you have. There might be 10 million viewers for this. I said, is Ryan mm -hmm. nervous right now? So were you nervous last night? No, I wasn't nervous. I, I, I think the only time I really get nervous is if it's the first time I'm doing something. Like a couple years ago, I did boxing for the first time. First, my first uh, uh, night of fight, the first few minutes of the first fight, I was a little nervous just because it was so unfamiliar. But I feel like if you prepared... Once you get into the broadcast, you just settle down. And last night, I felt 
very, very present. Um, and so, to me, when you're in that zone, then you don't really think about or feel anything else other than just what's happening in the broadcast at that moment. I think the, the only time, in addition to when you're doing something the first time, they can feel a little nervous is like that first moment coming on the air, um, just because you're trying not to flub any syllable where otherwise in the middle of action it, it doesn't really stand out, right? But if you're, if you're coming on the air and you happen to misspeak slightly, it, it stands out a little bit more. Um, but last night I didn't feel that. Last night I was just excited. And, and I think part of it was, like, guys, getting <clears throat> to the arena at 5, the gate's opened at 5.30 for what was like a 7.18 tip. At 5.30, people were running down to the bottom of the section in the lower bowl to go watch warm-ups. It, the, the place was completely full an hour before tip. And so I think I was just more, more so, you know, lost in the excitement of it all. Uh, and so I wasn't really feeling nervous. Now, the, bring the talk show host out in you. This gets yeah. thrown out, and I wonder if it's fair. And even if it's fair, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Does Clark have to win it all here to kind of bring it all together this type of a season? Or would it feel empty if she didn't win the championship? I don't think it would. I think what she's done has been so remarkable in the way she has you know, lit the sports world on fire, not even, you know, college basketball, not even women's basketball, but the entire world of sports. We know she's she's one of the handful of biggest stars in all of sports right now. Um, and and I, I, I joked about it the other day. It, it was unbelievable seeing in the lobby the line of people who wanted to take pictures just with her parents. Not her and her parents, just her parents. That's how big of a star mm. she's become. And, but I, I think... You know, being the all-time Division One scoring leader, right? Getting to the championship game last year and beating undefeated South Carolina. This year, beating LSU and getting back to the Final Four. I, I think it is, it, it does elevate to a, an even grander level of, of mythos if she can, you know, finish us off with a championship. But if she doesn't, I don't think it's going to really change any of the way that we look back at this run she's had. Now, Kim Mulkey, the, the head coach of LSU, has been criticized in some circles, Ryan, about they, the way they defended mm -hmm. Caitlin Clark. Is, is that a legitimate criticism? Yeah, yeah it is. I, I think it is. I mean, look, Caitlin was on one last night, and, you know, it, you can try and defend her any which way you want, and she's so good that it just may not matter. But I think it is a legitimate criticism to wonder why Flage Johnson did not get more of a crack at Caitlin as LSU's best perimeter defender. I, LSU wanted to take away all the others, and one of the things they talked about and their players continued to, to talk about as well that they had been told by the coaching staff is, look, Caitlin scores 30 in wins, Caitlin scores 30 in losses. What we need to negate is her getting everybody else going. But the problem is when you don't have someone on her who's making it difficult at all for her she is going to get the others going because she's going to be able to break them down off the dribble real easily. And there were times last night where there was odd defensive breakdowns where you had Haley Van Litt going under a screen when the big is in drop coverage. So Caitlin's just left alone at the three-point line. And that happened multiple times. And so I, I, I am – I know Kim went to last year POA pretty early for Haley Van Litt. And, and last year POA actually defended Caitlin – fairly well last year in the national championship game, but if I was LSU, I would have had Flaugier Johnson on Caitlin some just to try and make her life a little more difficult, even though they were more concerned with everybody else going off rather than Caitlin. I, I was going to ask, like, there's, a, there's so much stuff around Caitlin Clark, and I was doing my over-the-top podcast mm -hmm. with Beatle uh, yesterday, and we were discussing this. Does it feel like at times, Ryan, we're going a little bit like Lenny from Of Mice and Men? You know, the Tommy the Tommy boy. I love it. I love my pet. I said, I kill it. I am. Like, are we, I worry sometimes we're killing Caitlin Clark. Like, we are going to squeeze her to death with the level of pressure. Yeah, but she, she could play in the NBA. She could beat Michael Jordan one-on-one. -on -one. How many points would she yeah. score in the NBA? Right? Like, like, <laughs> Does that ever worry you, or does she just have the sort of makeup that it's going to be fine regardless? You know, 
Peter, I love the question and your line of thinking because I've worried about this. And I actually told them this the other day when we had our meeting with her and Gabby Marshall and Kate Martin. I said, you know, I'm thinking about you. I'm like, oh my gosh, how, how, how are you not just feeling the weight of the world as you're going through this with this unprecedented level of attention and expectation? And, and then I asked Caitlin, I said, you know, what are you most proud about from this season? And, and this is something I did bring up on the broadcast last night, but she said, you know, I'm most proud of the fact that I've been able to play with joy even as I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. And as we've talked to her over the last couple of days, she has mentioned multiple times that she has felt the weight of the world on her shoulders. But she also talks about how she does not get nervous. And the way she best deals with that pressure is by being out on the floor. And she's talked about, look, these games are the most fun games of the year. And that's really where her attention goes. Even last night she was saying like, it was so hard for her sitting around all day waiting for the game because she just wants to play. So, uh, Peter, to your point, like I have continued to wonder, like, she's still just a 22-year-old young woman. Is there going to be a moment where she's just you know, like, okay, like, you know, I don't know if it's cracks, but just doesn't live up to the hype. And what amazes me is even as she's had these unparalleled expectations, she seemingly delivers every time. Think about her record-breaking game this year when she passed Kelsey Plum. Insane. NCAA record. She scores 49, and she and she breaks the record on a on a logo three. Yeah. Last night, this is the most anticipated game maybe in the history of women's college basketball, and she drops 41 with 12 assists it's... and comes out of the gate and hits a 28 foot three on the first possession. You know, I mean, she just has a sick ability to to just dive into the performance and let that carry her through whatever she, pressure she's feeling. Yeah, she she gives a lot of Steph Curry in, in that way. In a lot of ways, frankly. Yeah. Um, one, more, one more thing to follow up on with that. I know that Angel Reese is not the kind of player that Caitlin is, right? She is not as flashy. Uh, obviously, she's great on the boards, she's a defensive player, um, and can score points, but she also has a big brand of her own, a lot of personality, yep. and can charismatic. Like, let's not forget how long the NBA was around. And it was a thing. Don't get me wrong. It was a thing, right? The, the, the Celtics of the 60s and early 70s, it was a thing. But it didn't remotely resemble what the NBA was after Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. Is there a feeling inside women's basketball that Caitlin and Angel Reese, if they were to go to the right teams in this league, could sort of represent players and rivals like that? You know, I, I think that there is a feeling of of that because one of the things that the WNBA and, and Kathy Engelberg, who's done a wonderful job as commissioner, has talked about this is, you know, trying to create rivalries and rivals because that, that is often what takes an audience to a next level. Last night is a great example of that, right, with Iowa and LSU. Obviously, Yankees Red Sox is an example that it's close to home for us. And so the WNBA trying to find that, and I do think it's possible – with Caitlin and with Angel. Now, they are, right, they're, they're different kinds of players, right? It's not a guard on a guard. It's not a big on a big. Um, but depending on where they go, I mean, Caitlin's obviously going to go to Indiana, but let's say Angel, let's say Angel goes to Minnesota, right? And Indiana and Minnesota are meeting in the playoffs. I think it's going to be a really big deal. And then forevermore, we'll continue to follow it up and watch it, especially if they're both having impactful WNBA careers. You know, I, I kind of have felt like Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson have had a little bit of that bird magic feel in the W with just being the clear top two players in the league and meeting in the playoffs year after year now. But... They didn't have the whole, you know, storyline sweeping into the pros from college the way that Caitlin, Caitlin and Angel do. And what we've seen metrically, guys, is, I mean, Caitlin, what she does to ratings is just astonishing. We don't, Michael, have the ratings yet from last night, but we do have the Sweet 16 game on ABC against Colorado, and it did 6.9 million viewers. It was higher than any men's game on, on Saturday. And, you know, that's the Caitlin Clark effect, which we're going to see what it, what it carries over to the W. But, Peter, I think there's a real chance that that storyline could extend into the pros. 
and, and could be great for the league and the sport. And what's cool, and I've spent a lot of time talking with Kaylin and Angel over the last few days, what's really cool is both of their awareness of their role in this moment in women's basketball and growing the game, and then also their appreciation for everybody who came before them to create the fertile ground for the sport to pop right now with that. Is she gonna? Is Caitlin Clark gonna entertain the uh, the big three offer? I don't know. I, I don't. Uh, you know, she hasn't said anything about it other than you know my agents deal with that. I don't think so, guys. I mean, I, 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 I certainly don't think she would if it was in conflict with you know her WNBA season. She all of her all of her sponsors are coming with her. She's only gaining more. Money is not going to be a problem for her. Um, and I, you know, we also are likely to see a significant growth uh, in the WNBA salary cap in a couple of years after their new media rights deal, which Caitlin is going to make that number uh, grow quite a bit. Just just the fact that she's going to be in the league. And her dream is to be a WNBA player. She grew up loving Maya Moore. You know, I, so I just, I, I don't see that happening. That's just me opining. I think the other part of it that makes me think happen is, you know, she could have gotten quite a bit of money to stay in Iowa, I think, too, you know, and, and was, but knew this was the, you know, next chapter that she wanted for her career. So, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't see it happening, Michael. I don't know anything, but I don't see that. I don't see that. As you're doing the games yesterday, are you checking the Yankee score? I wasn't checking oh. the Yankee score yesterday. I, Come but on. I did watch a little bit when I got back to my room, and I watched and was all over the the games against the Astros. I was the, actually I listened, uh, I listened a little bit too because I was driving to and from Albany at different moments. Um, but man. It was good, huh? Like, just the grit to win those games the way they did in Houston to start the year. Couldn't have had a better start to the season. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. Well, the Final Four, it starts Friday, right? Yeah, Friday, 7 to 7 Eastern on ESPN. Now, you kind of have a chance to beat Iowa? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have, they have, they, they have, a, they have a serious chance. I mean, Paige Beckers is unbelievable. And, you know, you... you you could absolutely watch Paige and say she's the best all-around player in the country. I think because of what Caitlin has done, it's hard to use that phrase because Caitlin's just, you know, so continually lived up to the, the hype of, uh, of her excellence. But Paige is incredible. Uh, you kind of have some other pesky defensive guards, Nika Mule, K.K. Arnold, and then they have a great big in Aaliyah Edwards. They're thin. So if they get in foul trouble because of all their injuries, they they, they can struggle. But um, but yeah, they definitely they they have a they have a good chance against Iowa on Saturday night. Well, all of us here at the show, we're very proud of you, Ryan. You've done us proud. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, man. I You're appreciate that. You know, you know, I got CMKF in my blood always. <laughs> Be good. Rest your voice, and like we'll be here on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Care, you guys guys. Are the best. Take care, Ryan. Have all a good call this weekend. All right. Thank you. Ryan Rucco. Oh, man. What a guy. Great father. A now. mensch. A mensch, if you will. Now, we were talking about this uh, in our pre-show meeting. And mm -hmm. let's bring it on to the air. So, okay. uh, sometimes we are the prisoners of now. You're the moment. The thing. And, you know, there, there's talk... Radio listeners, sports talk radio listeners, uh, you know, the, 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 the demo that is valued by advertisers is men 25 to 54. And we're all talking. We're interested because I think all three of us love to see greatness. And man, woman, whatever, Caitlin Clark is great at what she does. Angel Reese is great at what she does. Paige Beckers is great at what she does. So I have a legitimate interest in these games because, as I said earlier, I believe that women's college basketball is closer to the basketball that I grew up loving. They pass the ball. Uh, it's not all about three-pointers. No, three-pointer is prevalent, but it's not like the NBA, which is everything is a three. But do we think, guys and gals, that our listening audience is really interested to a level to, to engage in conversation about Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. What, what do you guys think? 
It's interesting because what is a sports talk radio listener in New York? Michael, if you're if a diehard Met fan or Yankee fan or Ranger fan or Islander fan, you were probably watching those games last night because you love your teams. But there might have been a lot of people that are sports fans that didn't have a dog in the fight or just thought, this is really exciting, I'm going to go watch it. Or Mets fans were just like, I'm good. But, 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 I, but I don't know how you quantify it because we, we, we take the phone calls and what do we hear? Passionate fans about their teams. Right? Everything is generated by... Their favorite team, Yankee fans talking about their team, Met fans, Ranger fans, Giant fans, Jet fans. You know, uh, when we get into the general sports conversation, how much does it change? Because I don't know if anybody is an LSU fan or a UConn fan or an Iowa fan. Like, probably not here in New York, right? So they're watching because they just want to see, like you said, greatness, something exciting. It's, it's a, it, it, there's a buzz about it. I want to check this out kind of thing. But I do feel like a lot of our audience is driven by the teams that they root for. I, 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 and do you have a dog in the fight here, or are you just kind of watching the spectacle that is Caitlin Clark? Listen, I, you guys know, I'm, I'm, I'm much more of this than either of you, certainly than Don. Michael, I think you're probably a little closer to me. I love the big moments. Like, I really enjoy when in a sport there's just a huge thing happening. I mean, they could draw. I've never been an F1 guy. But if there's the right F1 storyline, which it sounds like this upcoming season maybe there will be, if there's the right storyline that draws me in, that could get me. You know, it, it, uh, boxing, the Olympics, it all can get me if the storyline's good enough. And the Caitlin Clark, there's two storylines working here. And now with the UConn part three, but you have the Caitlin Clark storyline alone of are we watching the greatest who's ever done it. Then you have the Caitlin Angel year-long sort of story that's been going on, which was interesting. Right. Now, Michael, you'll get the UConn, who people are kind of forgetting about, as almost like dogs now up against Iowa. So I think there's all these things that make it compelling. I would have been, if I had not been so entrenched in the WWE situation with it being the week of WrestleMania, I would have absolutely been dialed in last night, but I was at Barkley Center. I spoke to Andrew Gunling, who volunteered to me randomly, that him and all of his friends were texting about the Iowa LSU game. And he said it was the first time he recalls, like his entire friend group, all talking about a women's basketball game. So I do think that there are people out there, if we were to take calls, who would say it was the first time that they ever made appointment viewing for a women's basketball game, particularly one that had nothing to do with the school they went to. Well, you can run it up the pole if you want to see. We can do that, and we could take your phone yeah. calls. If you really want yeah. to engage, we're here to engage. That's why we wanted to talk to, to Ryan. So we find it interesting because it's obviously a big national story, but at our core, we're a New York show. We talk about New York things. So as Don said, do you have a dog in the fight? So uh, it's just an interesting thought um, uh, engagement, whether or not you're in or into it or not. 1-800-919-3776. Peter, a lot on your plate. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. And if you did get overwhelmed, what would you do? 